Thank you, Veronica. Um, so, I'm Graham Bragg. I'm a lecturer at the University of Southampton. Uh, I'm responsible for teaching pretty much all of our computer science undergraduates uh, networking, and this year we've basically gone for a focus of IPv6 first. So they're taught networking uh, from IPv6, and then we go, and here's how you do it in IPv4. So we are trying to really push um, so that our future network, ad our future graduates are capable IPv6 network admins. Um, as a university, our journey was similar to Imperial's um, up to a point. We were one of the very first to actually have deployed IPv6. I mean, we started playing with IPv6 back in 1996 before it was even a standard. And we had our first public um, IPv6 connectivity in 1997. Um, unfortunately, we diverged sometime around 2015-16. Um, and IPv6 has now fallen by the wayside. I mean, we've still got it on our edge room, we've still got it on our teaching VLANs in a couple of places, and even with just it in those specific places, campus-wide, we're still hitting about 30% IPv6 traffic every day. Um, so even small IPv6 deployments can move a lot of your traffic off of v4 onto v6. Um, but yeah, pretty much we're similar to Imperial, 24K students, about 6K staff, um, similar size institution, just slightly different deployment. Uh, personally, I do research in networking as well, uh, environmental sensor networks, lots of IPv6 deployments there. Um, and more recently, I've been doing things with something called event-based computing, where we've got lots and lots of teeny tiny devices doing very parallelized workloads. Uh, next project coming up, assuming it gets approved, is actually going to be do, to do with financial risk modeling, and we're doing most of that in the cloud. So somehow I've got to get this weird bespoke compute fabric working with clouds, and it's going to have to be IPv6. So this has been very useful today. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, though, is IoT and IPv6. So the first thing to do is define what I mean by IoT, obviously Internet of Things. So let's start with the things side of that first. So when I'm thinking about IoT, my definition is essentially physical objects that are instrumented or actuated with a digital presence. That could be something small like a toaster or a refrigerator, could be cameras, could be all sorts of things. But then it could also be something much, much bigger, like a mountain or a volcano or a glacier. So one of the things that I've been involved in, we actually shoved very long-range wireless links in and IPv6 enabled a glacier for environmental sensor monitoring. Um, that was a fun project, uh, and I'll talk to you about another one that we did in a little bit. Now, what do we mean by internet? Now, you might just think internet connectivity, but in general, it's that we can interact with it remotely. That doesn't necessarily mean over the internet, though. Okay? Um, IoT has been uh, messed with as a definition to basically say anything that you can react, control remotely or interact with via a computer. So my definition is basically network-connected things that you can control remotely that represent a physical object. So obviously one of the big things in this, which ISPs are going to run up against, is the home automation landscape. A lot of you have probably come across home automation in one way or another. Um, and what we'll find is that there's lots of technologies and systems out there. Now, a lot of these technologies are used in other types of IoT, so it's a good example. Technologies-wise, we're looking at things like typical wireless networking. You could be looking at Bluetooth, more bespoke things like Zigbee and Z-Wave. Thread is something we'll talk about in more detail a little later. And then you could also have LoRaWAN for connectivity. Uh, other options for IoT, you've obviously got Ethernet. You've got more basic 802.15.4 radio networking or even just more raw radio communication. And then we can't overlook this without talking about GSM and narrowband IoT. So there's lots and lots of different technologies, and then what you'll find is that there are lots and lots of different IoT systems out there. So Apple Home, Google, um, Amazon, they've all got their own cloud-based IoT management systems. Hive from British Gas, even IKEA run their own with lots of stuff. Um, basically, lots of different systems out there, most of them bespoke, very few of them open, so getting all these things to talk together is a challenge, which is where other technologies like If This Then That, Open Hab, Home Assistant come in. So it's a very, very horrible landscape at the moment. Um, 
and we're basically talking in the grand scheme of things in the IoT landscape that there were about 14.4 billion active IoT connections uh, in 2022, and the predictions are on something like 27 billion connected IoT devices by 2025. Um, huge growth here and huge fragmentation. And the fragmentation is nothing new. So back in 2011, uh, Microsoft actually did a survey of the sort of home automation landscape. And the big things that they identified were uh, inflexibility of interconnected devices, um, poor manageability, and just a massively fragmented landscape. Nothing's changed since we've exploded there. Um, so one thing that you might have realized, though, is that a lot of those technologies I talked about didn't give IP addresses. Zigbee certainly doesn't have an IP address associated with it. Neither, neither does Laura. So what you find that in a lot of the home automation um, and indeed a lot of the research um, sensor network deployments is that they are using manufacturer-specific hubs with proprietary control software and proprietary cloud services to allow you to manage your devices. Um, that basically means that if you want to give someone access to one of your devices for whatever reason, there are lots and lots of examples we could come up for with this, you've got to hope that the cloud service that you're using allows that, um, or you've got to give them access to everything. So it's quite inflexible, which is what Microsoft found. Um, sorry, my notes are on a different screen. <laughs> Um, and even then, when you're using standards-based connectivity like Wi-Fi, you've still got the proprietary control software. So the IoT challenge here is not just one of IP addresses and connectivity. It is one about the higher levels as well. So if we've not got IP addresses and we're using gateways and bridges and effectively glorified NAT, can we do global accessibility with v4? One way or another, yes, but you're pushing the cloud infrastructure. So my hot take and my controversial point for the talk is that IPv4 is really holding back Internet of Things deployments. Um, a lot of what we are having to do is to work around the limitations of IPv4. The lack of addressing means you can't have global identification for each device, which means that you are pushed towards the centralized proprietary solutions and then these can't interact with each other. If you've got 1,000 IoT devices on your network, NAT hasn't got any chance of giving you remote access to any of those in any sensible way, shape, or form. Prevalence of NAT, and now CG NAT makes it even harder. CG NAT, you're then competing with however many other people that you're sharing those addresses with. You're again pushed towards the outbound cloud um, options. And all of this pushed together basically means that we are potentially heading to a big, massive e-waste problem because you've got all of these proprietary IoT devices that require a proprietary cloud system, and if they turn it off for whatever reason or change how they're doing it, your device is then not usable. Um, so when I bought solar panels quite a few years ago, it came with a solar panel monitoring system called the Nile Intuition worked absolutely fine for several years. Then all of a sudden, the provider turned around and said, oh, we can't sustain this business model anymore. Um, we're going to start charging you some ludicrous amount for using this hardware. The hardware still works. The hardware is simple, and it could work with just about anything, but it will only work with their system, with their cloud provision, and they now charge for it. And even if I turn it on, it'll just talk to their cloud system and send the data without me being able to access it. And this is what we're encouraging with IPv4. So does that mean that IPv6 is the answer here? Not completely. Okay? It's not the answer to everything, but it is one of the building blocks because it helps solve the addressing and accessibility problem. You can get away from relying on NAT and ways to get around NAT. You can then do interesting things. Um, like allow direct access to devices from authorized other devices. So one of the things that I did uh, during my PhD, in fact, during my PhD Viva, was we had a deployment of IoT sensor nodes up in the highlands of Scotland, several kilometers up the side of a mountain, and I was sat there in the Viva, and I could ping all the way up the side of this mountain, 
and get responses back just from a laptop computer. I could even access the data directly from the sensor node without having to go through any proprietary cloud system. This was just using standards-based applications on a normal laptop going through standards-based networking over the internet. And that's what IPv6 gives us as a facility. It gives us the ability to do that. Now, obviously, there are still questions over how do you give IP addresses to low-power, low-performance battery-operated devices. They can't run a full network stack. OK, that's a given. But then you've also got an application layer problem still. Um, it's all well and good having this access, but if your vendors are still pushing you towards the proprietary, their own system, you don't get anywhere. So let's have a look at some of the standards that are involved in a network like this. Um, very briefly going through the big standard for low power devices, it's called 6 low pan. And essentially, this is doing IPv6 over um, very low power, short-ish ranged uh, radio links. I say short-ish range because these radio links can use a variety of frequencies, and we've done multi-kilometer links with these. You're not meant to be able to. They're designed for sort of 10 to 100 meters. Um, one thing with 802.15.4, though, is they're very small packets. You're talking 127 byte frames. So that means that 6 low pen has to rely on something called header compression and then fragmentation. And we're obviously far below the 12, uh, 1,280 by MTU that you're expecting with IPv6. So fragmentation really is key here. Header compression is the interesting technology behind it. And it just takes the 48 bytes of an IPv6 header and a UDP header, shoves it right down to 6 bytes. And it does that by using assumptions based on the link layer. So a lot of the addressing, a lot of the network, prefixes, et cetera, it can extract from the link layer of 802.15.4. So you end up with really small IP headers, which is really useful. But it does let you do fun things like multi-hot mesh networking um, with uh, standardized routing protocols. So project that we actually used this in, which is what I did my PhD on, um, was essentially a project called Mountain Sensing, where we got a one-year proof of concept funding grant from one of the research councils, is just to deploy an IoT sensor network in the Highlands of Scotland. Everything was standards-based in the network stack. We're using 802.15.4 um, for the physical and MAC layers. We're using 6 Lopan at the network layer with RPL, UDP, and then a protocol called CoAP, which is essentially HTTP over UDP. Um, all of this was done with microcontrollers, so no full-blown systems, battery-operated, solar panels to keep them charged. So what do we actually do? Well, map of the deployment area, the link from our base station all the way up to our first routing node was just over three kilometers. That was done with IPv6 and low-power radio radios. The study site overall was about five kilometers wide. Um, and you can see the picture of the, the nodes that did it. The actual microcontroller responsible for running that is under the yellow dot, which just happens to be about the same size as a chip. But yeah, so these were, this was bespoke hardware um, that we built for this. And they were just there running that network. Um, the network itself, it was multi-hop through and through. Um, the whole network, with the exception of the middle router, but, you know, proof of concept deployments, you can't always get all the money for everything, was a full mesh, and there were multiple routes through most of it. So if any single node, with the exception of router 1 and router 2, went down, the network just carried on. So these technologies were great for that. Um, and this was essentially... IPv6 up the side of a mountain on batteries. So what did we actually learn from this? Well, we got the first published sub-gigahertz 6 low-pan environmental sensor network. Hadn't been done before. Now, all of the major um, IoT operating systems support it in one way or other. The drivers are there. The timings are there. The support's there. They know how to do it. Uh, we demonstrated that low-power IP-based sensor networks can be used for real-world deployments. And we did that by getting years of data. So off this one-year project, we ended up with 
uh, a one-year test deployment, and then we put something out in the final year, and that brought back over two years of co near constant data from this system. Um, that's just one of the random sensors that was actuated, one of the temperature sensors that's on them. But this gave us never-before-seen insights into natural processes because the sensors were always there and the data could just be picked up remotely. You didn't have to use site visits. You didn't have to have um, students go up and read sensors. It was all automated. It was all pushed back, all standards-based. Everyone could get the data. So IoT as a concept is massive. But obviously, technology has moved on since then. This is a few years ago now. Things have gotten better-ish. Um, the latest standard for sort of connectivity is something called Thread. Uh, it's one of these royalty-free open, open industry standards. You've got to pay for certification uh, to get the logo on Thread devices. Google have very helpfully put out an open source implementation called OpenThread. Um, and this is integrated into a lot of current smart home devices. So Google Nest has it, HomePod Mini has it, the Amazon Eero stuff, uh, all sorts of things from C um, Samsung SmartThings. They're all embracing Thread. And what Thread actually is, is essentially a standardization of the middle layers of the networking stack. Um, it's IP, IP base, it's encrypted, self-healing, resilient mesh networking. So it's sort of taking the stuff that we've, um, we were using and then putting it to the next level. Um, so they actually are based on 802.15.4. So technically, you could sort of do what we did with this, but I don't think anyone has been mad enough to try that yet. Uh, it's UDP with uh, data transport layer security, um, and you've got security and commissioning throughout the stack. So this is trying to take these standards and implement them in a way for an actual secure final um, product. This is something that is emerging. Um, there is more and more support coming for this in products. Um, and the idea is to basically enable interconnectivity at the networking layer. Because even within something like Zigbee, there's far too much fragmentation to actually have a Zigbee device from one vendor work with every Zigbee hub from other vendors. This is meant to get around that um, problem. The next thing that is coming, and this is the latest and greatest, is something called Matter. And essentially, this is an open source protocol standard for IoT and smart home applications. It is very, very new. We're talking it was standardized into it, or the first version was standardized in 2022. We're expecting the second version soon. But it's sort of intended just to simplify smart home setup, control, interoperation. All the big players in home automation have already adopted it on their hubs. Software updates have gone out. You can now run it. Well, Amazon Alexa, Apple Home, Google Nest, they're all supporting Matter out of the box. No real devices yet. A uh, whole host of them were announced at CES, but they're not out yet. And yes, this does mean that all the devices don't necessarily work with this new standard, which is a bit of a disappointment, but it's where we are. So is this just another standard, though? I mean, second obligatory XKCD comic for the day. Um, in short, no, it's not just another standard. Um, Matter is essentially a unifying application layer standard. Okay, so this one's addressing the, the application layer problem. It uses existing communication standards. Um, there are also ways to bridge non-matter devices into a matter network. They've already thought of that. You will obviously need a new hub or a hub that supports bridging between whatever proprietary network standard you're using and matter. Um, but it's something that is going to hang around because most of the big players in home automation are there already. And if they're supporting it, other vendors are going to get on board. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So how does, what's the actual concept? Well, if you've ever tried anything with home automation, you'll know that you can buy a hub and you can buy devices that will work with that hub. You can then decide you want a different device, but that isn't supported by your home automation um, provision. So you have to buy a different hub, which uses a different app. So you're left there like our friendly clip art person there, thinking, which app do I use to turn on the bedside lamp? <laughs> 
And yeah, you've got a whole host of different devices to do different things, which is obviously not user friendly, it's not good for anyone. Uh, and if you want to buy a new device, you've got to work out which ecosystem you want to put it in. Because even when a device supports multiple ecosystems, um, you can only control it from one of them at a time. You can only have it associated to one network. Matter is essentially meant to unify all of this into one friendly ecosystem, where you can have all of the devices connected to one Matter controller, and then you can use any Matter um, compatible management application to manage those devices. If you want to then, say, add into your ecosystem a refrigerator, as long as it's matter, it will just work. A washing machine, it'll just work. And if you want to chuck in other devices for, say, Zigbee, you just need the bridge, and they'll work. That's the concept. Um, whether it turns out to be what actually happens or not, we don't know. But the technology behind it is essentially it will run on top of Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Thread. They've even got uh, support for Bluetooth planned. However, the big caveat with Matter is it needs IPv6 to work. Um, it uses IPv6 for operational communications. It leverages IPv6's multicast support for doing multiple device groups within a network. Um, and all of the traffic between the devices is IPv6. Um, so essentially, if you're going down the Matter route, you have to have IPv6 support, or at least not disabled IPv6. And what's probably going to come down the line is if you want to integrate this with a public um, cloud-hosted solution from one of the vendors, you might need IPv6 for that. So summary, and I'm going to try and get us back on time a little bit here, is IPv4, as it is, is essentially discouraging, encouraging a disjointed proprietary IoT landscape that's not good for the environment, it's not good for consumers, and it's just encouraging bad practices throughout. IPv6 really does enable innovative IoT applications. Um, and what you're going to find if you're in academia um, is that more and more research is going to be needing IPv6 for the IoT research they're going to be doing, because this is one of the big buzzwords at the moment. But IPv6 is one of the building blocks. It's not the, only, it's not the solution, but it is a building block. Um, home automation, though, is embracing v6. They require v6 going forward. So this means that the mantra of disabling IPv6 in your network so that you get around a load of network problems isn't going to be feasible in consumer setups in the very near future. And we all know that after some time, enterprise automation solutions tend to follow what happens in the consumer space. So down the line, we're going to be ending up in a similar situation um, with enterprise uh, building automation, etc. So that's all I've got for you. I think we're not quite back on time, but very close. So any questions? Yeah. Okay, Tim. So, so, so when I was designing Hive, uh, one of the things I expressly put in it was an IPv6 layer uh, over A2.2.15.4 because at the time it was primarily based on Zigbee and Z-Wave, but there were 96 other protocols. The issue was these protocols were not really networking protocols, it was the upper layers. Yep. So both Zigbee and Z-Wave have got a concept of a scene and they've got concept of locks that don't interoperate. So I spent a lot of time talking the developers away from that, that standard onto using IPv6 and then putting on top of it a layer of abstractions that, that, that made sense. But one thing I... No, it's just, so it, Hive did have that in, it might have taken it out. <laughs> but, well, Hive now does seem to be pretty much Zigbee standard. Uh, it, it, it might well have gone that way because British Gas um, smart meters are based on Zigbee. Yeah. But it should have been over V6. And th th that, that's how you get new devices in. Um, one thing I did have a lot of trouble with was, though, was uh, mesh networks. Yes. I never managed to get those to work because they're so volatile. I'm intrigued you managed to get them to work. Um, so we had no issues doing it with the with RPL, which was standard implemented. Mm, that's, that's interesting. We and didn't it, have to tweak anything; it yeah. just worked off but, the shelf. Okay. And, and another thing on, on top of that, I was quite it's quite straightforward to support AMQP, which is a banking protocol. Yeah. Free, free messaging protocol. So there's a lot of talk about stuff like co-op and whatever, which are very low. You don't really need that crap. Yeah. <laughs> you can put a mature thing in front. Yeah. 
yeah, co-op worked absolutely fine. We've also run MQTT on top of it. Oh, I'm, no, not MQTT, AMQP. Yes. Which is what banks use for trading. Yeah. yeah. But we were looking at things like co-op and MQTT. But, but, but what, MQP, so MQTT 5, which has got transactional integrity, or the ones before that, which you can't guarantee get delivery in Yeah, days. it was before that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this was several years ago, so things have moved on. This, this is 2012 when I was doing this. Yeah, but you know how long it takes everything to I know, I know. appear in some Sorry, I'm still... Sorry, it wasn't really a very good question. <laughs> So I think this is an uh, encouragement for, for me to invite somebody from France, from EDF, because they have um, Linky, I think his name, the smart meter, and actually that's all IPv6. So maybe the British cars could learn something. Anyway, thank you very much, Graham. This was excellent talk. Thank you.